game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Welcome to the Meta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm speaking today with Dr. Christian Conti, PhD. Christian is a licensed professional counselor, a certified domestic violence counselor, and one of a handful of top-level certified anger management specialists in the world. He currently applies his yield theory in maximum security prisons throughout Pennsylvania and speaks to law enforcement officials around the country. Christian is the author of several books, and his most recent, Walking Through Anger, a new design for confronting conflict in an emotionally charged world, was just released by Sounds True in October of 2019. Welcome to the Meta Hour, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a real delight. I feel so, I just, I feel so excited to share the information <laughs> I'm going to get to share with you today. That's fabulous. I really feel, I just feel excited. I, I, I used to say, oh, I was a professor for a long time. And I used to say, today's class is going to change your life. And the students would say, you say that every week. And I said, every <laughs> week, <laughs> every week there could be a moment, a kernel of information that helps you see the world differently. And it can change everything. And I've always been kind of that excited about life. That's fantastic. I'd love to start our conversation actually with something of your story. If um, you can talk about what set you on this path, what inspired you about mental health, about prison work, field of anger and emotional management. And, and, you know, I'm curious, of course, as to whether you have a meditation practice or some kind of contemplative practice. Yes. So uh, I guess I would probably start with absolutely do I have meditation practice. I think that is, uh, that's, that's like breathing to me when my, when my physical exercise, when I don't keep up with that, there's one thing I don't miss out and that's on my meditation practice. I've been doing that for a little more than 20 years. Um, so really excited to share that my daughter, our daughter is 14 and she's never missed a day of meditation since she was six and a half. No, that's so and great. I'm telling you, Sharon, and we have a little girl who can regulate her emotions phenomenally because I really attribute that to the meditation she's done every day. So, yeah, absolutely. And and how did I get into this? Because it it is it's funny. We look at the world of psychology, and you think a lot of times people get into things to study to learn about how they can handle it themselves. My approach was a little bit more. It was different. It was academic. So my mom was an English teacher. She um, was very strict. And I remember when I was going into ninth grade, she said to me, because I grew up in the 80s where they were kids would circle up and they would have fights. <laughs> and my mom said to me, she was a teacher at the high school, and she said, I better never find out that you ever watched the fight. If you ever see a fight, you step in, you break it up. So from the time I was very young, I would step in when I saw conflict. I remember kids saying mm -hmm. to me, why don't you let them fight? <laughs> I'd say, Sharon, I'd say, do you want to go home and face my mom? <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was a, that was an, uh, when I really reflected on this book and I was thinking, what drove me to where I am? You know, I believe that one thing led to the next in the story of everyone's lives, but in my own life, that was, that was instrumental. So was when I was a teenager, my dad, I asked him, he was an earth scientist and I was a haughty little brat teenager. And I said to my dad one day, Hey, Dad, what do you like about studying rocks? And he said to me, he said, listen, if you're only going to live on one planet your entire life, why not get to know that planet? So that 
insight that really resonated with me. And when I was in high, when I was in college, I was trying to find out what to study. I thought about his advice, but I I shifted it, and I thought I'm only ever going to live with me my whole life, so why not get to know myself? And that's when I started to study psychology. And honestly, Sharon, that that's when I think about the onset of my path. It was when I see conflict, I step into it. I seek to learn about myself. I'm I'm the one consistent person who will be with me in all of my interactions. So why not get to know myself? Mm. So, you know, something that you just said uh, sparked this, this other question in my head, which was um, some of the people I've talked to talk about violence as a public health issue. And I'm just wondering mm. what you think about that, that notion that it, it can be addressed I, the way we address another epidemic, you know, that has biological roots, perhaps. Well, there, there def- we can definitely address it that way. I would be um, I would be grateful for any attention that's a paid paid to it because oftentimes when we even start to talk about violence or people who do violent things, it's just a black and white conversation. Well, they did this, so they should have this. But honestly, after twenty thousand plus hours of clinical experience, I, I see that nobody wakes up and just does violent things out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like really one thing led to the next. So if we were to look at it that way, we would probably get more focused attention on it. Um, I'm actually helping right now. I'm, 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 we're doing, I'm doing some work around when people get out of prison and if they are reoffending, especially in terms of violent offenses, because I specialize in people convicted of violent crimes, but I'm doing work around right now, developing programs that can be really transformational. Like when guys are getting out of prison, so this is what I'm so passionate about. Nearly seven out of 10 people, when they leave prison, they come back Mm. and we somehow think that's okay. That's not okay. That's not, I mean, that's something that like, it's a blessing people like you would have me on to even talk about this subject because many people don't want to talk about, Hey, they're in prison, throw them away. That's it. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is People are coming back out. And who do you think they're reoffending on? They're reoffending on everybody in society. Mm-hmm. And and so and, and we're all brothers and sisters. We're all connected. And so why why would I not care if someone's getting out in some other state? I still care. And here's the thing. So I believe that when we try when we're trying to help people learn a different path, oftentimes we focus on the crime that was committed. But all too often I see this where once something's done, and let's say it's 10 years, 20 years later, those men and women who committed those crimes that, that long ago, they're now no longer focused on those crimes. They've, they've come to terms with it. But now, if we don't help them with how they handle their impulses, if we don't teach them new behavioral patterns, mm-hmm. then how can we expect them to do anything differently when they get out? Mm-hmm. So my, my, what I try to emphasize is teaching, constantly teaching. What are we teaching people? Um, and I think that when we recognize ourselves in that light, it, in other words, when I realize that when I speak, you're learning about me. When I, when I live, you're learning by watching what I'm doing, whether that's a positive, negative, whatever example. And so I have to take complete responsibility for myself and what I contribute to the world. So would you you consider like you're teaching like a skills training? I do. I, I, li- I, love, I love that phrase, a skills training. You know, so yield theory, I developed this approach called yield theory in the 90s. It's now an evidence-based approach. And, you know, I, I say this, I say often that we're quick to be skeptical of others. We're quick to say, oh, oh, I don't believe that, especially if someone disagrees with your beliefs. But how quick are we to question our own egos, our own beliefs, our own thoughts? And so to really be skeptical about our own certainty, I think is an important piece. And what I do is, what I did is one day I sat down and said, what do I do? Like, what, what do I really do? I sit in a chair and I talk to people. So what do I do? I stand at a, a person's cell door. And what, what am I doing? And the three things I came up with are this. I listen, I validate, and I explore options. 
Those are the core actions. Those are the skills that people can learn. Listen, validate, explore options. And, and here's the thing, Sharon. I was speaking at a mental health uh, conference a few years ago for about 500 attendees. And a woman came up to me at the break, and she was, she was pretty condescending. She was probably in a tough space, but she was pretty condescending. And she looked at me, and she said, uh, that's it? That's your big theory? Three things? <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, but if you think about it, all Bruce Lee ever did was move, block, and hit. And he <laughs> did pretty well for himself. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I mean it's not it's, – when we talk about loving kindness, it, it doesn't sound complex, but it takes effort <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, when I say listen, validate, and explore options, what I then teach people to do, and I'm actually training the entire Department of Corrections for the state of Pennsylvania, but I'm, I'm training all their employees in this, and what I teach them is it's how you listen. It's how you validate. It's how you explore options that makes all the difference in the world. Well, it seems to me like if I think about my own experience of being angry, it's not a state where, I mean, feeling it is one thing, being lost in it is another. But at times when I've been lost in it, it's not a state where I sense there are any options. Right? It's like the whole so that, world that, closes that, down. Yep. That's excellent. That's actually, that's, that's hitting the nail on the head. And that's what happens. Anger, anger narrows our focus. And so we're not really able to see the bigger picture. Which is why when you listen to people and you truly validate them and you acknowledge the anger and the emotion that they're experiencing and they don't feel like they have to fight someone to show what this feeling is, now they're more open to the options, which are, I, I believe there's more to this story than what you're seeing. Um, and I, I think I have a pretty powerful analogy I'd love to share with yeah. with with your listeners and everyone. So when my daughter was five years old, she came home from school with a pamphlet. And the pamphlet was about a religious belief that was different from our own. And in it, it said, this is the truth. And so my daughter looked at me and said, Daddy, this has to be the truth because it says this is the truth, right? So I, she was five years old at the time. I took her up to her playroom I said, I had her lie down on the floor on her stomach. I had her close her eyes and I put a big box in front of her. And then I put different objects around each side of the box. So when I invited her to open her eyes, she was so close to the box, she could only see one side. And I said, what do you see? And I had a My Little Pony set up. She said, My Little Pony. I said, yes. Is it true that there's a My Little Pony right there? And she said, yes. And I said, wonderful. Is it also true that there's a My Little Pony on every side of the box? I mean, she's five at the time. So she said excitedly, yes. And so I scooted her over so she could see two sides of the box. And what she saw was there was a little book I had set up on the other side instead of another pony. So she said, oh, it's a book. I said, that's okay. But does that make it any less true that there's a pony on the other side? And she said, no, it's still true, right? That's truth. To the people who see that side of the box, that pony exists, and that is the entire story. But now I asked her, I said, is it true that there's a pony and a book on the other two sides? And at five years old, Sharon, this is what my little baby said to me. She said, now, Daddy, I don't know. And I said, that's it. When you can learn to listen to people with the humility of understanding, that what people see might be the perspective, the side or, or one or two sides of the box that they see, and that there may very well be true to them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that speaks to the entire truth of the entire box mm -hmm. or that there even is a box. Um, and then I quoted to her the opening lines of the Tao of Te Ching. Um, we're, we're, we practice Zen Buddhism, and I, I quoted um, Tao of Te Ching. The opening lines are, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. Like this one side of the box, that doesn't tell the whole story. Is your experience like when somebody is um, experiencing anger? Uh, I mean, from the Buddhist point of view, I guess we would say that the tendency is to have one of two kind of extreme relationships to it. One, 
possible way of relating to the anger is to dislike it, to be afraid of it, to try to deny it, to try to stuff it down. And the other extreme is to just get lost in it, lose all perspective, lose a, a sense of space or being centered. And we kind of, depending on our own habit and conditioning and families and stuff like that, maybe favor one or another, or we just bounce back and forth between these extremes. And we talk about mindfulness as a place in the middle where you can certainly sense what you're feeling, you're honoring it as the experience of the present moment without getting overcome by it or pushing it away. So does that reflect sort of one of the skills that you're offering people? Uh, absolutely. So so even though I have the three core conditions of listen, validate, and explore options, those core conditions, those core actions are driven by seven fundamental components, and one of which is mindfulness, exactly talking about what you're, you're speaking about now, which is, you're right, there is, Carl Jung uh, coined the phrase, in antiodromia which is a fancy word saying we go from one extreme to the other. Mm -hmm. And so we do, we have this, well, it's, it's, it's also in psychology called splitting one extreme to the other. So, well, either we're going to uh, stuff it down and ignore it, or we're going to immerse ourselves so fully into it. What I think the, the teaching is that I try to share with others is that it's about balance. It's about understanding and learning from anger. Anger isn't wrong and bad in and of itself. In fact, if you could personify anger and talk to it and say, what are you, what are you here to teach me? Um, what a powerful change in the way you would experience that intense emotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would say that, you know, one of the um, positive attributes of anger is just sheer energy. You know, it's not being passive. It's not being complacent. It's not. Uh, saying, yeah, I'm not worth better treatment or, or anything like that. You know, it's it's very energized. It's maybe drawing a boundary or pointing out what's wrong. Um, but it's also in the Buddhist psychology, anger is likened to a forest fire which burns up its own support, which means it can leave us devastated. It can damage the host. And not only that, like a forest fire, it can burn really wild. So it might leave us in a place very, very far from where we want to be. And when you think about it, you know, I'm sure you've encountered a lot of people who have like one extremely regrettable action, you know, yep, which 100%. which they got called on, they got caught with, you know, and um, and really it was just like this fire, you know, that actually came and went. Well, it's a, it's a, that's uh, I love, um, I love those analogies. I think that's so powerful for people. I think people can see that. I, I, the Buddha says the anger is like holding a hot coal and mm -hmm. trying to throw it at someone else. You're obviously going to burn yourself first. So one day I was doing a counseling session and a woman was telling me how she was really angry at a former friend of hers. So I shared that analogy with the Buddha saying, you know, anger is like holding a hot coal. You're burning yourself before you ever hit someone else. So I had a water bottle with me and I, I said, imagine this water bottle is that hot coal. Now, I want you to be able to throw it at your friend, you know, your former friend. So I, I tossed her my water bottle, and she's sitting on the couch holding this. And I said, now, I want you to go ahead and throw it at your former friend. And she said, but I don't even know where she is. Mm. And I said, that's the point. You're standing here holding this, burning yourself constantly, and you don't even know where she is to throw it at her. And so she immediately released the water bottle. And what a cathartic moment, because it was like, look. You can spend a whole lot of time trying to find people to burn them, but you're burning yourself the whole way through. I love the analogy you gave. You're burning down your own forest to try to hurt someone else. Uh, it's not going to work. So do you, um, how do you counsel people to like find the strength to take action? You know, Because obviously you don't want to leave them just passive. Right, right, right. So, the, so the, probably one of the biggest skills – within all of this is assertiveness because if you simply just, if you try to just ignore it, well, that's not realistic. In fact, our latest neuroscience shows that our brains don't ignore things. They might, you know, change your focus for a moment, but we don't ignore things. So I, I, what I do is I teach people how to be assertive, say what you want to say, 
But here's where yield theory comes into play. It's one thing to stand up on a soapbox and tell the world how, what they should believe, how they should think. It's another thing entirely to speak in ways that are actually heard. And that's where yield theory comes into play is to say, it's not about just saying whatever you want to say, because you can stand on your pedestal and tell everybody how they're wrong, how they should all think like you and believe like you. But that doesn't actually do anything to change their way of their perception, their experience of life. But if you can truly meet them where they are and then open their eyes and then help walk with them side by side, well, that a, put your ego out of it, and B, it, that's more about trying to really learn versus me telling you and I'm right, you're wrong. Do you ever get called in to work with like incarcerated youth? Yes. So I am in all the maximum security prisons in Pennsylvania, and I go throughout the country. Um, there's one prison in particular in Pennsylvania where they deal with uh, teenagers, uh, young people uh, who were sentenced to long sentences as teenagers. And it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, one of the things as a father, when I look at these young kids and I think, what, what baby faces, you know, you see these young mm -hmm. faces and my gosh, what they've been through, what they've done. Um, it's so intense. It's so much more than I even share. I won't, I won't even share mm -hmm. the majority of the experiences because I wouldn't want the, I wouldn't want that in the universe for people to have to even think about. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why I always tell people be mindful about what movies you watch and what mm -hmm. music you listen to, because you're filling your brain with that stuff. Um, but yes, I do. I do get caught into work with them. It's very sad to see those young people, but I also see this. When I go into those institutions, and so I'd normally go in for like six months at a time, and I'm actually coming up on, I'm going to go into our, our facility for six months with the young people. But when I've gone to visit and speak with them before, one of the things I noticed was how hungry they were to want to learn a different path. Because, my goodness, we learn math, we learn science, we learn English. Do we learn how to deal with the emotions that we mm -hmm. all experience? And so when there's somebody standing up there, and I'm, I mean, I'm six feet, 250 pounds. I'm a bald guy with tattoos and a beard. I look like every other person at a biker bar. I understand mm -hmm. that. <laughs> you know, I never, I'm not pretentious. I don't have a pretentious bone in my body. So I'm, I, I go in in a t-shirt and jeans. So when these kids see me, I say, listen, I'm just giving you practical stuff. For instance, think about this. I, I say to them, as I say to all people I work with, imagine that there was, you, you're, I'm holding a puppet, and I say to the puppet, hey, puppet, you're no good, you stink, and the puppet's all sad. Well, I'm in control. And if I say, well, I'm just joking, puppet, you're great, and I love you, now he's happy, well, I'm still in control. And so I say to young people and older people alike, you know, it sounds silly for me to be talking about a puppet, but then I ask them the very challenging question, which is, how many of you have had your day going one way and then someone comes along and says or does something that shifts the direction of your day and hands go up everywhere? And I say, in that moment, you allowed that person to make you their puppet. Mm -hmm. So now these young people say, well, I don't want to be anybody's puppet. Okay, great. Let me teach you a different path, a way to seek to strive from your true self, not strive from your ego. Because as long as you strive from ego, you're going to be going up and down and back and forth. Was it was it your choice to go into maximum security prisons? I don't know if that's exclusively or, or largely, or was it just the way it ended up? Well, I think, um, you know, it's definitely a choice. It's definitely something I want to do because I have a very, um, I feel like I have a very blessed career in the world of professional sports and in the business world, but I love what I do in the prison system and I will continue to do it because I'm, I, I don't like the idea of people being locked up. And I understand, I understand more than many that there are some people who can never get out of solitary yeah. confinement. I've watched them, you know, I had a guy who, uh, you know, real, raped men, women, children, and every cellmate he ever had. So who's going to put him back in a cell, someone else? Yeah. 
and, and think. So there are some people who can't be connected with others, but at the same time, the thing I'm passionate about is how could we expect people to magically learn a different path if we don't teach them one? And uh, so that's why. And I go in there and I feel like I have the strength. Plus, I'm good to be on the spot. So if they want to challenge anything I'm saying, I say, please challenge it. Let's talk about it. You can challenge me. And that's why I role model the assertiveness. Challenge me. I'll stand in front of anyone. We can talk. But at least listen to what I have to say. And I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I was really, so really you know, I was really curious about the kind of the difference, like between going into a minimum security prison or a, was it a medium, the middle one, <laughs> the medium security well, prison or a maximum security prison, which is a whole other world of intensity, right? It is, it is, because in a in a in a minimum security prison or even medium, you can have. Uh, oh my goodness, I was at one facility that was a medium security and they had uh, five corrections officers and they had 600 people out at yard. So five people aren't doing anything for 600 people if they decide to change their mind. Um, but when you realize that a lot of guys are on their way out, they're not really, so we, people have a projection when they've never been in a maximum security prison or, or even a prison. And they think when I go in there, everybody's out to kill everybody. And that's not the reality. A lot of people are just trying to get through and trying to figure out what they need to do in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, you can go in and you're probably safer than what you realize. But then on the other hand, in some of the more intense places, it would be naive to think that it's all easy and there aren't people ready to do something mm -hmm. because there certainly are. So I brought in recently, I brought in NFL Hall of Famer Ray Lewis. I had him come speak with me at a Supermax prison. And you know, we're standing in this auditorium in the gym and there were a couple hundred inmates there. And, you know, one guy challenged him, Rat challenged Ray and just wanted to kind of like scream and yell and have his moment challenging him. Um, Ray was open to talking, but the guy didn't want to talk. He just wanted to yell and then wanted to go back to his, his cell. And in that moment, like I kind of, I left there that day and I thought, well, that's the metaphor would be like a drive by yelling. Like when you really want to change someone's mind, but you don't want to have mm -hmm. the strength to stand and challenge and talk about it. So you just do a drive by yelling. I feel like that's what happened to Ray. Um, but in that moment, I mean, I think it's important for people to understand if you're not authentic, if you're not, if you're not living the message you teach and you're standing in front of hundreds of inmates who are incarcerated, you, you better think about that reality if you're not authentic if you don't practice your your message because you're going to be challenged every which way but i think that's always been an advantage of mine is i come in and i say look we're all in this life together it's not about me having information i happen to have some information i can share with you but you can equally teach me because i truly believe enlightenment comes from anyone anywhere at any time one of the things I, I've not taught in many prisons, it's been very, very occasional, usually when there's some kind of ongoing program and I go in as a guest. And, um, but I've seen even in that kind of minimal acquaintance, you know, <laughs> the vast amount of possibilities of getting really angry because the system feels um, largely arbitrary in a way. Like there was a women's prison that I was going into and I'd heard that 108 women signed up to do my program, which of course is this kind of mystical number in Hinduism and Buddhism. So I thought, oh, terrific, you know, and, and on the very day, only 35 women were allowed to leave their cell, you know, to come. And why? Right. Who knows why? Right. You know, it was just that way. Or uh, I went to a prison in Wisconsin and... um in leaving, um, these parents were coming, trying to see their son, you know, so we were just kind of crossing paths and, uh, who was about to have surgery or something. And, and the, um, guy at the desk said, no, you can't see him today. And they said, but we drove from like Nevada, you know? Right, right, and right. And they said, N he said, no, not today. You know, and I watched them swallow and just like take it because there, there was no choice, you know? Uh, or they might never see him before his surgery. And uh, it's, it's just true. like there's so much that could just enrage you, you know? And, and if and, you don't have the ability to deal with your emotions, perhaps so skillfully to begin with, you know, there you are. Right. 
Right. And, you know, that's something called impotent rage. There are different types of rage, but impotent rage occurs when you don't, you, when you feel powerless to do anything about a situation and that rage builds up and builds up. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's a complicated subject, but here's the easiest way. And I really try to work to make things as, as digestible for people as possible. But here's how I would break this down. I think people really truly believe you're either on one side or the other. So mm-hmm. they, they, they have the saying when you're in prisons, well, you're a hug a thug if you're trying to do treatment and, or you're just on the category of lock them up, throw away the key. And I throw people off because I look like I'm the guy who's going to lock them up, throw away the key, but I come in and do treatment. But what I say to them time and again is this, I, and this is unfortunate, but it's reality. A lot of times because people identify with a, one group or another group or one side or another side, that when they come in to work with the guys, their mindset might be, oh, these poor guys you know, they're, you're either going with this, oh, they're so, I'm, they're treated so terribly, it's so awful, or you're coming in going uh, that they, what they did was awful. And what I do is I look at both perspectives and say, you know what, I don't like the way some people are treated, but I also understand why some things have led to another in the story of what our correction system is. Mm-hmm. And so I, first and foremost, I'm all about security because when these officers are, are hurt, And, you know, and to think that guys who have trained for most inmates in the prisons I'm dealing with, because again, I'm talking about literally the most maximum security get in. We're talking about people who've spent their entire lives practicing manipulation. And if you're, if you've practiced, let's say, uh, meditation your whole life, you know, get really good at that. Mm -hmm. But if you practice manipulating people your whole life, you get really good at that too. And what I saw is people could fool when people would come in from the outside. So I I stayed around one time. I remember I was in a prison and, um, again, because of the way I dress and and the way I approach things, I think I can get away with stuff that people don't know, but I stayed around. I did some undercover stuff and everybody thought I had gone. And there was a woman who came in from prison society and amazing, wonderful, kind, beautiful heart, beautiful soul, human being goes in, talks to some guys who are in solitary confinement, you know, leaves going, oh, this is awful. They're being tortured. I can't take this. This is so civil rights. It's not fair. The moment she left, everybody thought everybody's gone. The inmates started laughing, mocking her, going, I had her eating out the palm of my hand. I told her this. I told her that. And so I think if I hadn't been undercover, they would have, it would have been the Hawthorne effect. I would have been present they wouldn't have let that their guard down to say things mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. But being able to have those types of experiences have helped me see that I don't go in saying inmates are all innocent and, and the system's all terrible. And I don't go in saying everything's perfect and they, it should mm-hmm. be exactly the way it is. I really believe there's a balance. I think we need to teach people the path we're hoping that they learn to take. And so if we don't teach them that, you know, we talk about, you talk about meditation and you, you, you spread light throughout the world with what you teach. The guys are open to this. I mean, I'm talking about solitary confinement. I do meditation groups with guys and they're open to it because we all want to have peace on some level. Well, with, you know, you're, you're really talking about a profound dissolution of the sense of self and other, you know? Which I would imagine comes in very handy if you're working with uh, guards and and inmates both. So why uh, why don't you say something about your work with um, security personnel in in the prisons? Well, so many of them are hardworking, uh, good people who are really getting the the, the, really the brunt of it. So imagine we, we, we say this cause you have to have humor when you work in the prison system. If you don't have humor, you're mm-hmm. probably going to crumble really fast. But we always say like, could you imagine if someone who worked at a bank their whole life heard for even one hour, how inmates might scream and, 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 and pick you apart for every insecurity you've ever had mm-hmm. and start screaming and cussing it at you. Imagine you have to deal with that for an hour, let alone your entire shift day in, day out for years. So these guys, again, and men and women, they go through a lot that, and my whole yield theory, my whole yield theory, Sharon, is about seeing the world from other people's eyes. So when you start thinking of these officers being gone, 
stop people coming at them, coming at them, um, then, and not giving a lot of training. I understand why they are where they are, but it makes me all the more passionate to teach them there's a better way. And that's why I'm training them in the shield theory, because I'm saying, if you could take a minute to not be reactive and instead maintain your presence, not take it personally, then what happens is you start to be able to hold up a mirror for people, in which case they see how they're coming across to others. And now you don't have to get swept up in the back and forth argument of it all. And so these officers, they go through a lot. Um, they, a, a lot of guys come back from uh, the military and they've, they've, they've encountered some intense stuff. So my heart goes out to all of my, it's about education for me. That's really what all of this is about is teaching them a path that keeps them safer Mm -hmm. than for instance, if somebody, let's say they don't know how to handle their emotions. Well, they go off on an inmate, they go, the inmate first and foremost initiates it with them and then they get caught up in that. And now they go back and forth. And I say, what are you really teaching the inmates in that moment when you're getting caught in that? So I need you to learn how to take care of yourself so that you can practice this message of self-discipline and compassion and loving kindness. Because once you can practice it, now you can do it in any circumstance. So if you were describing the yield theory in brief, I know you've written several books, so you probably have had to do like the elevator pitch, you know? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. You describe your book as the elevator doors are closing and you go, I don't know. Um what, <laughs> what would you say about the yield theory? So I would say yield theory is all about meeting people where they are, getting around, circumventing that defensiveness, that fight or flight response, and speaking in ways that can be heard. It's all about leading with compassion, seeking to see the world from other people's perspective, and then shining conscious education. Like mm-hmm. just offering them something. Here's a different. Here's a different thing to consider. I'm not being attached to. It. And and the truth that what what really separates yield theory from other other approaches, um, like motivational interviewing and things like that. Beautiful, wonderful approaches. Here's what separates yield theory. It's the idea that concept of non-attachment. Um, because if someone were to say to me, "Hey, this yield theory stinks. I don't believe in it," I'd say maybe it does. Again, it's that box. Maybe you're seeing a side of the box that I'm not mm-hmm. seeing. And I believe this is one of the things I would attribute to my faith in that I believe the Buddha, I, I learned this the most from the Buddha, but he, he talked about, you know, he gave so many beautiful examples. One of them was, it's traditionally called the soap of the teachings where, you know, you wash your garment, the soap's on it, and that's wonderful, it's clean, but if you really want it to be ready to go, you got to wash the soap out of it. And the Buddha said, look, I don't expect my teachings to last for 500 years. Eventually, you, you figure it out, you move, you move on. And what an incredible uh, uh, model of non-attachment. Mm-hmm. Like, here's something I believe in, I live, but yet I'm saying I'm letting it go. And I love that. And, I, and I, that's what honestly separates the work I do from what I've seen other people do. Um, When people ask me, well, what's different? Why do you go in and why do you have success? This is what I attribute it to. I I went into a supermax prison a couple weeks, about a month ago. This guy who had over 200 assaults on officers was in the restricted housing unit or what you would call solitary confinement of the whole. And he said, uh, so there was a new officer on that pod and they were, and the, the inmates were out in yard. And so imagine you're, you're, you're in solitary confinement. So you get one hour a day, five days a week out in yard, out of your cell. And yard is a cement everywhere. And basically the only thing you could do is look up and see sky. The only Mm -hmm. difference between your cell and that you can see sky, but you're in basically a bigger dog cage. So now uh, this is, I was in this particular prison was the largest, um, uh, restricted housing unit in the state. So they had five, 400 uh, uh, cells for this. So this is a big unit. So the guys were out in yard and they were being brought back in. So everybody was back in except this one inmate who has had historically over 200 assaults on staff. And there was a new corrections officer and he came in. I just happened to walk into the room at this moment, but he just came in and he said, so-and-so, um, I won't say his name, but so-and-so, 
I, I, he, he wouldn't even look at me. He spit in the other direction, and he was really frustrated. He was he took it personally. This this officer did, and he was like, "I can't believe he did that to me." You know, so disrespectful. And so the officer said, "Well, Doc's here. Why don't you go talk to him, Doc?" So I said, "All right, I'll go talk to him. I never met him, but I'm happy to." So I walked out, and he was the last inmate in. Yeah, I say quote yard because again, we're talking about a dog cage looking up at the sky. So we're not talking about a beautiful yard. Um, and when I walked over to him, I started to talk. I said, Oh, you know, I just made small talks, beautiful day, sun's out. Um, he looked to the side and he spit. Well, this is pretty much the same thing he did to that officer. Mm -hmm. But when that happened to me, I looked and I said, Oh my goodness. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, I realized I didn't even introduce myself. I said, I'm Dr. Conti. I come into prison six months at a time. I work with staff. I work with inmates. And I try to help everybody gain a little bit different perspective than where they're going. And he couldn't contain a smile. And he looked at me and he said, I've been down for 20 years. He said, I have never heard a staff member apologize. Mm. I said, well, I said, well, I was wrong. I came into your space and purported that you would just talk to me because I'm, because why? Because I came into your space. And he couldn't get over that I would apologize, that I would say, I, was, I said, of course I was wrong. I, that one of the advantages of being authentic is recognizing that what is your ego and what is your true self. Your ego wants to be right, but your true self is that striving toward personal growth, toward love, connection, kindness. So anyway, I said to him, so I said, listen, my man, I was wrong. I'm quick to admit it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And, uh, so I ended up having a real good relationship with him when other people couldn't talk to him. And it really boiled down to, I was living that message. Like, I'm not going to tell you to do this if I can't live it myself. Mm. You know, I'm also thinking, um, listening to you of my friend, George Mumford, who had done some work in prison, but, uh, is maybe most well known for teaching mindfulness to sports teams, which I know you also, you also work with athletes. So George wrote a book called the Mindful Athlete, which included the years he worked with the uh, Chicago Bulls and the L.A. Lakers. And um, so when his book came out, he and I did some things together in New York. And I said to him, uh, George, you use the word mindfulness when you work with these teams. And and he said, well, now I can, you know, because it used to be like this weird woo-woo word. But now it's um, so much more um, validated in so many ways. And then I said, do you use the word compassion? And he said, that's too much. So I hmm. said, what do you say, <laughs> you know? Because I knew he must talk about the quality, and I just couldn't fathom how he described it. And he thought for a moment, and he said, I say, don't be hating. Don't be hating on yourself. Don't be hating on others. <laughs> um, so I when I hear it. you talk, you're talking about connection and love and kindness. And I'm wondering, uh, what words do you use? So I, um, um, I'm pretty secure. It's taken me a long time to get where I am. I decided to wake up like this, but at 46 years old, I'm a big, strong, uh, physically powerful person. And I'm comfortable with the reality that I, I see, which is compassion is what connects, connects us. So I feel comfortable using those words. And I'll even say to guys, like I'm saying compassion, like if this was 20 years ago, I wouldn't even be able to say this word, but I'm saying it to you now, because let me tell you what it really means. It means suffering with, mm -hmm. in other words, you tell me something, I feel what you're saying. I feel it. Now I'm suffering with you. Now, why can't I call it what it's been called? That's what, that's what the word means. And so that's all this is. And so I kind of normalize it for people, but I will say this, and I, and I do agree with George on this, and this is fascinating, but when I'm doing overall trainings with the officers, I find it, I kind of replace in my seven fundamental components. I don't always say compassion at first. What I've found that is more effective to not shut people down from the beginning is to call it professionalism. And so I'll say to people, okay, what's more professional to go back and forth arguing with someone you calling him names when he's calling you names, or is it more professional to say, look, this person's struggling. Like my job is not to go back and forth with you. Here's what we do. And, the, and they're quick to jump onto that. And again, my job is to meet people where they are, not where I think they should be. So I don't go in saying, well, they, they should be open to this word. I go, I understand that. Like you, you guys are worried about safety. Like how many people go to work 
And, and, and I think the minimizing really irks people. In other words, they go to work every day with the potential of either getting a life-threatening disease or being attacked and killed every day. And so for someone from the outside to go in and say, well, these officers, like, well, they don't want to talk about this stuff. Well, of course they don't, because if you think of compassion in that sense, you think weakness. And so what I have tried to do, and I, and I, I work to do this, is I start to get the guys to talk about that word eventually. Like once I connect with them, I say, are we strong enough to talk about compassion? I'm a father of a daughter, my little girl, like that is my life. So what that greater thing can I give the world than to show my own daughter compassion in all instances? And what if I could have the strength to show the world that? So I throw it out there. We talk about it. I try to role model that assertiveness. And I say, let's talk about this word. It's not, it's not something to be afraid of. We care. Like uh, I have gang members who write me these letters and they'll be, and they're, and they're, they're some of the first people who will say, man, I love you, doc. I appreciate you so much. Like they're the ones who are expressing that love and compassion in their own way. Wow. So I, I, I honestly, I, I just try to demystify it and say, we need each other. We need to connect. That's great. So tell me about your new book, Walking Through Anger. So I'm so excited to share this book with the world because, so I think the world comes down to two kinds of people. I think we basically, we have people who have issues and dead people. So if people are currently alive, they have issues. Um, this book, I think, is targeted to help people understand, learn about themselves, and learn about how to handle others when they're really angry. And they're, 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 I tell lots of stories. So I tell lots of Zen tales. I've included tons of Zen tales in this, in this book, things I've heard, things I've made up. Um, just really ex excited to sh teach in stories. So I tell the story about, you know, there was a monk and he was walking down the way and he had a, he would check himself out in this little mirror and a woman came up to him and she said, I don't understand. I thought you were a monk and you were supposed to be holy. And I see you checking yourself out all the time. That seems kind of vain. And the monk pulls out the mirror and he says, all this, he said, I carry this with me wherever I go, because anytime I encounter problems, I pull it out and remind myself that I am both the source and the solution to my problems. So the concept is to turn inward, look, learn about what are you bringing to each situation. What I teach with yield theory is let's look inward at ourselves. The only person we can actually control, let's learn about our own emotions. Let's learn about why we do the things we do, and let's learn how to communicate with others more peacefully. So I, here's a wonderful way I'd love to explain this. I was going throughout this last Supermax prison I was in. I was consulting in the prison, and I was mostly there to work with the uh, staff at this particular prison, but I, I loved the, you know, doing my speaking, so I was speaking to a group of inmates, and the inmate said, could you go throughout the prison and go block to block and tell everybody what you're about? So I said, okay. So I, I meditated, like I do a lot of stuff, like I meditate every day, but I really meditated on this idea that I'm going to go block to block during what's called block out, which is when the TVs are on, people are playing games, this, they're out in the, you know, in their, out of their cell in the common area at night. So I was going to go into this block and I'm going to go block to block throughout the whole prison. Basically, I'm shutting off the TVs and I'm going to share a message with these guys for 30 minutes. So I had to think what would resonate with them? what's going to work, like what's going to, you know, I'm shutting off a, prison, a TV in a maximum security prison in the middle of a movie. That might be the only chance they have to see that movie. Um, so I, when I meditated and I reflected, I said, all right, there are three things that I worked on. So I went block to block, and that's exactly what I did. I shut off the TV. I say, God, gentlemen, I want to speak to you. Here's the deal. If you go in a coffee shop and you say, man, I'm thirsty, what are people going to say? They're going to say, well, what do you want? You have to say what you want. The same is true for the universe. Just say, well, I want success or whatever. What is it? Let's be clear with it. And then I said, like, if you've ever sat with someone in hospice in their final moments, you know, people aren't thinking, man, I wish I got over on so-and-so. I wish I pulled the wool over so-and-so's eyes. What people are thinking in their final moments is about peace. They're, they're, they want peace. And so I said, listen, we all know this. And I, and I said, imagine your cellmate came up to you and said, 
hey, I'm going to play pro basketball when I leave prison. And you said to him, great, when do you practice? And he said, well, I don't practice. I'm, I got a 10-year sentence. I'll just start practicing when I get out of here. You're going to say to him, there's no way you're going to play, right? Because we master what we practice. So the same is true with peace. If we all know we want peace, then we have every waking moment to practice peace. So I said three things, inner peace, education, because we're all going to to learn about books, knowledge, wonderful, but also to learn about yourself. And then finally, legacy. The past is gone. We can't change it. We can't get a second of it back, but we can do something from this moment forward. So inner peace, education, legacy. And this movement I started in this prison, it really picked up. I mean, Sharon, it's so exciting because I've heard from people from the department now that these guys are now making educational videos for each other. The mm. inmates are, they're doing peer groups. I mean, they're doing some really cool stuff um, that has significantly changed. And that was the movement based on those three things, inner peace, education, legacy. And that applies to all of us. That's fantastic. So I'm wondering if for our last few minutes together, you could lead us in a, a short meditation. Definitely. Yes, definitely. So I would say, if you're in a position where you can close your eyes, that'd be awesome. If you're driving, please do not. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Wherever you are, say I would, I would say try to get as comfortable as you can get. And I'd love for you to just take a couple of deep breaths. So we'll take some deep breaths together. As you're breathing in and out, I would have you imagine that you're breathing in cleansing, peaceful energy, and you're breathing out any kind of negativity that's inside of you. And after one or even two breaths of breathing in this pure, beautiful energy and breathing out any negativity, you feel very clear. You feel very insightful. And so I would imagine, I would have you imagine somebody that you have struggled with recently, someone who maybe angers you, someone who, when you see their name or you see something they say, it bothers you. And I really want you to visualize that person. I want you to see that person clearly. And now I want you to imagine that your eyes lock with that person's eyes. And that you kind of move through the energy of your eyes to their eyes. And now you're seeing yourself from their perspective. You feel their body. You, you feel if they have any pains, you feel them. If they have any sadness, you feel it. If they have any anxiety, you feel it. Insecurities. You are literally that person. And now you see yourself coming at, at this person. And you see the anger that's in you as you judge this person, as your anger comes toward them. And now you're this other person experiencing your own anger, your own judgment. And when you experience it, it freezes you. It awakens you. And so you let go of that judgment instantly. And the moment you let go of that judgment, you move from that person's insides to your own insides again. And now when you see this person, you see that he or she has had a reason for why they've done everything they've done in their life. One thing has led to the next and the story of their life, just like your own life. And there are things that people can't see about them that lead them to doing what they're doing. In this moment, you release that judgment. You release that negativity and you feel lighter. You feel that sense of light. And as you feel that sense of light, it starts to move through you. And if you feel comfortable, it'd be a great time to start to open your eyes and share that light with the world. Now, thank you so much. Thank you for our thank inspiring you. conversation as well. Thank you. I, I, your energy is just so beautiful and I really appreciate it so much. I think you're spreading so much light to people. Thank you. And I'm hopeful that this, this book does the same. Yes, thank you. I hope so too. So if you'd like to learn more about Christian's work, you can visit his website at 
Dr. Christian Conte, that's D-R-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-C-O-N-T-E dot com. His book, Walking Through Anger, A New Design for Confronting Conflict in an Emotionally Charged World, is available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats wherever books are sold. Big thanks to all of you listeners out there. This has been the Meta Hour podcast from the Be Here Now Network. Have a great day, and may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you live with ease. Hey folks, thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.